OK, we're going to look at AC 3.3, which is the limitations of agencies in achieving social control. Now we're moving towards the end of unit four and these next two ACs, AC 3.3 and 3.4, really focus on the evaluation questions that come up in the exam. Now, in general, these are worth the most marks. So in evaluation questions, what you're generally going to be asked to do is to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the various different agencies within the criminal justice system in terms of how they achieve social control. So are they effective or aren't they effective? And if they aren't, what are the barriers that are stopping them from doing that? And if they are, what are they doing well? Now, if you are evaluating, the most important thing you can do in your argument is to back up the points you're making with evidence. So particularly for this criminology A level, you need statistics or case studies to support the points you're making. And unashamedly, unashamedly in this PowerPoint, I'm gonna bombard you with just that. And you need to pick those out of this PowerPoint and be really clear that you've got those stats to back up any evaluation you are making. If you're trying to get the highest bands in the exam, you have got to have stats and you've got to have case studies or examples to back up what you are saying. There's more than enough here and there'll be more than enough in my next PowerPoint on AC 3.4. So go back over this repeatedly, make sure you've got the stats to hand. Okay, let's make a start. So, we are examining the limitations to agencies. There's a number of these that I'm going to look at, and I'm going to start with repeat offending as a limitation to the agencies in achieving social control. So if offenders fail to rehabilitate and they continue to commit crime, then you can't achieve social control. It's an impossibility. Now, these stats suggest that the recidivism rates in the UK are a major limitation to achieving social control. Just have a look at some of these. 2017, the total recidivism rate for all offences, 30%. On average, those who re-offend commit a further four offences each. The number of re-offences per offender has been rising steadily since 2009. So it's not getting better, it's getting worse. The reoffending rate for offenders released from prison in 2017 was 37.5 for all prisoners, rising to 64.1 for prisoners who received a sentence of less than 12 months. Now that stat may suggest to you that actually shorter sentences are not effective or not as effective in terms of keeping the recidivism rate down. So you might need to think about that and think what the reasons are, which I will address a little later on. 40% of juvenile offenders re-offend within a year. For juveniles released from custody, it's actually higher, it's 68% within a year and 74% for, for those who receive sentences of less than six months. So once again, that shorter sentence doesn't appear to be working. So we need to try and work out why that is the case. Now this links to specific theories that we've looked at, and you could argue that we've got a link here to social learning theory. In this PowerPoint, when you see writing in red, I'm linking it to a theory. And these are the theories you've looked at in unit two of the course. And don't be afraid to link some of these theories in if the question um, is relevant. So social learning theory could explain some of these stats. Um, if offenders are stuck up in prison with other um, long term prisoners, they learn and they copy within that prison system. And so prisoners can actually become better criminals. We hear of people saying that prisons are schools for crime. And if prisoners then become better criminals, they learn skills from others, and that encourages them to continue offending upon release, hence the rise in recidivism rates. That's a possibility. And again, that might address some of this issue with the shorter sentences. But of course, 
Again, we're looking at limitations. We're going to carry on with this idea of recidivism, but it's also got a knock-on effect. If people keep reoffending, inevitably, you're going to get a, an increase in the prison population. And the prison population has more than doubled since 1993. Now, you might think it's recidivism that's causing that, but actually, in reality, even though it's a contribution factor it's got less of an impact on the prison population than the fact that actually courts are now dishing out longer sentences which means people stay in prison for longer for example in 2018 sentences for indictable offenses were on average 26 months longer than they had been in 2008 don't know where that rogue apostrophe has gotten into were I must be having a brain melt Apologies for my poor grammar. Um, secondly, the average minimum sentence for murder increased from 12 and a half years to two th in 2003 to 21.3 years in 2016. So in 13 years, the sentence for murder has more than doubled. So you're going to be in prison twice as long, hence the rise in the population. And it's inevitable that the prison population will rise given the above. Now, you can link that to theory as well, because right realists would say that prison works. But I think you could argue that the recidivism rates would suggest otherwise. Clearly, prison is not fulfilling its aim of rehabilitation in this country. You can use uh, that prison population graph to see how things have changed. You can also look at who reoffends. The more previous convictions someone has, the more likely they are to reoffend. In 2017, 49.3% of offenders who had more than 10 convictions reoffended, habitual criminals. And offenders who'd served a prison sentence were more likely to reoffend than those who received a warning, fine, or community sentence. Now that might be because they're hardened criminals. By getting a prison sentence, you've probably done a few things wrong beforehand. Most people don't go straight to prison unless it's a serious crime. So it could be that that stat on the other side of the coin is linked to the idea that people in prison are more likely to be hardened habitual criminals and therefore recidivists. But that still doesn't change the fact that prison doesn't appear to be rehabilitating that much. It's also true to say that males are more likely to reoffend than females. Those with drug or alcohol addictions, the homeless, those with fewer qualification and the unemployed are more likely to reoffend. And it's also important to note that any figures I'm quoting refer to stats that have been proven. So all these stats about reoffending have been proven. They're people have gone to court and have been found guilty. But in reality, it's likely that there's much more reoffending that's gone undetected and unpunished. The dark figure of crime that we looked at in um, unit one of this course. And you can link this to Marxist theory. Marxists wouldn't be surprised at all that unemployed offenders are more likely to reoffend, as they've got, they would argue, they've got little chance to meet their needs if they have to survive solely on benefits. So, other barriers as well as the recidivism rates. And what I'm going to do with the recidivism rates, I'm going to look at some of the reasons a little later on as to why they may, may be so high and what are the causes of some of that. So, another barrier that we've got are civil liberties and legal barriers. So civil liberties are your basic rights and freedoms granted to citizens of a country through law. So that's stuff like freedom of speech, freedom of movement, you can go where you want, freedom from arbitrary arrest, the police can't just turn up and arrest you for no good reason, freedom of assembly, so if you want to meet in a group you can, freedom of association which allows you to hang around with who you want to hang around, and freedom of religious worship. And these are linked to the due process model of crime or justice that we examined in AC 1.3. For example, freedom from arbitrary arrest, where the police can arrest who they wish, or freedom from detention without trial, where someone can be held in custody indefinitely without being brought before a court, are both important protections for the individual against the state's abuse of its power. 
So you can argue that the legal processes involved in due process do limit the state in exercising control over its citizens without good cause. Now that might be a good thing, but it's still a limitation and something you can refer to. And that would link to Marxist theory yet again, because Marxism would suggest that the laws are necessary to protect the working classes from the ruling elite. And that's really important. And I put here a case study for you. And this is a case study of Abu Qatada. Um, he was um, a originally, a, 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 he came from the country of Jordan. Um, he was arrested back in, uh, later on in the PowerPoint, um, early, tw uh, early 2000s. But in 2012, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that he couldn't, we couldn't deport, he was considered to be a hate preacher, back to Jordan because of the risk he'd be tried on evidence obtained by torture. Theresa May, who later became Prime Minister, was the then Home Secretary. And she said that the radical Islamist cleric, cleric would have been sent back to his native country of Jordan long before had the EHCR not moved the goalposts by establishing new legal grounds for blocking his deportation. Eventually, he was deported to Jordan in 2013. He'd originally claimed asylum in 93 on a forged passport. He was repeatedly imprisoned and jailed in, jailed in the UK after he was detained under anti-terrorism laws in 2002, but he was never prosecuted for any crime. And indeed, when he did return to Jordan and stood trial, he was then acquitted. So we have him in the country from 1993 all the way through to 2013. So for 20 years, we tried to deport him back to Jordan and the law stopped us doing that. These sort of legal barriers to um, enforcing social um, social control. Now, this next section goes some way to answering those recidivism rates. So bear this in mind as we go through. And these are the barriers of access to resources and support. So few people could argue that offenders need resources and support to help them rehabilitate. If resources and support are limited, the ability to rehabilitate is limited too, and that in turn limits social control. Now, there are a number of reasons that you can give that explain why prisons fail to rehabilitate offenders. And short sentences are certainly one such thing, because you could argue that short sentences don't give sufficient time to do the intensive work needed to address those deep-seated problems such as drug dependency, illiteracy, anger management, etc., etc. If you're going to wean someone off drugs, do a thorough drug rehabilitation uh, course. Remember, someone who is on drugs and has gone to prison has probably got numerous counts of shoplifting, etc., because they'll have stolen to fund their habit, etc. They'll be, you know, a, a serial, um, a serial criminal. They need time to work around that drug habit, and a short sentence isn't going to do that because you haven't got the time. And the other issue is that the these courses, there's only limited numbers of courses, uh, places on these courses, so not all people have access to them. So it's a vicious circle. So I've already mentioned the inadequate resources for education and training. Um, in the, the Ofsted has said that almost three quarters of the prisons require improvement or are inadequate for learning and skills. Now, this, I haven't put this in the PowerPoint, but one of the things you might want to consider is that one of the main barriers for prisoners when they actually re re leave prison is getting a job. And certain, certainly in prisons, some of the training they have is based very much on what they are able to offer. Now, if there is a shortage of plumbers in the country, it would make same sense that you train prisoners up in a profession where there is a shortage so that when they get out, they are more likely to get a job. If you've got, so therefore, if Dartmoor Prison is able to train people in plumbing, if there's a shortage in Devon, that would make sense because when they leave the prison, 
there's jobs waiting for them because there is a demand. However, if Dartmoor Prison don't have people that can train people in plumbing and can only do, let's say, painting and decorating or plastering, and there is no shortage of painters and decorators and no shortage of plasterers, there are no jobs for the inmates to go to on their release. So some joined up thinking needs to happen with a lot of the education and training. And I think this is a really powerful stat that you can use here because 51% of people entering prison have the literacy skills expected of an 11 year old. Now, in the general adult population of the entire UK, that stat is 15%. So, you know, 85% of the country are pretty okay. Only 15% aren't. But in prison, it's the majority. 51% have the literacy skills of an 11 year old. How can we possibly expect people to get on in society if we are not addressing that issue in prison? Let's carry on. The other issue you've got is that there's been a 15% cut in the number of prison officers. Now that means there are fewer people to supervise prisoner activities that could help their rehabilitation, which means that less people get rehabilitated and therefore those are your limitations to social control. Prisoners being released on temporary license, ROTL, that's intended to allow trusted prisoners out to attend training, employment and job interviews. But the reality is that very few prisoners are able to take advantage of this scheme because there's a shortage in staff and they're not able to supervise it because they're needed back in the prison on the cell blocks. So the shortage in staff leads to a shortage in staff being able to help out with ROTL. Another vicious circle. So when a prisoner is released on licence to serve the rest of their sentence in the community under the supervision, as we know, of the probation service, there are still many problems. Lack of money, for instance. Prisoners earn very little from prison work and when they are released, they are given a £46 discharge grant. That is the money they are given. So if they went into prison with nothing, they leave with £46. I've mentioned lack of employment. Only a quarter of prisoners have a job to go to on release. And homelessness is a massive issue. One in nine prisoners, when they are released, have no settled accommodation to go to. They lose housing benefit if they spend more than 13 weeks in prison, which means that if they were a tenant of a house renting somewhere, that tenancy would have elapsed and they haven't got anywhere to go back to if they are serving a prison sentence of more than 13 weeks. Now, you can use as a case study the End Friday Releases campaign. And this is a really powerful campaign and I put a link to a five minute YouTube clip which explains some of the issues faced by prisoners due to a Friday release from prison. Now, a, a, a third, over a third actually, of all releases from prison happen on a Friday. And charities and pressure groups such as NACRO, Howard League for Penal Reform, have supported a campaign to end Friday releases. Because they argue that if you release someone on a Friday, you've got a race against the clock to access the services needed before they close for the weekend such as accommodation, drug medication, benefits, etc. All these things that someone would need. Because the reality is if they don't get that sorted, that results in people having to sleep rough and survive on their discharge grant, remember it's £46, until those services reopen on Monday. And that leaves these people incredibly vulnerable to reoffending. In some cases, simply to get a roof over their head for the night. And unsurprisingly, due to this, some ex-prisoners quickly breach the conditions of their license and a recall to prison as a result. So use the End Friday Releases campaign as an example of a campaign to change and get rid of some of those barriers, some of those limitations to helping, um, helping prisoners and lowering recidivism. 
Um, we could also talk a little bit about community sentences because whilst they're more successful than prison in reducing recidivism, they're not without their problems. And there's a number of reasons for this. There's inadequate support for complex needs, such as those people who have drug addiction, mental health problems, homelessness, because there still are limited specialist programmes or limited places on specialist programmes to address those sort of needs. There's also inadequate supervision by the probation services. There's been criticisms that the service is too lax. They allow offenders to miss supervision appointments, etc., etc. And there's also been massive criticism of the failures by privatised community rehabilitation companies. They've been criticised for failing to meet their targets, poor supervision of offenders, and in some cases, even supervising their clients remotely by telephone. And if you go back to my PowerPoint on the probation services, there's a lot more on those uh, community rehabilitation companies. Finance is a massive issue. Public sector funding is limited cuts in budgets, austerity, will impact on the effectiveness of agencies providing social control. So here are some of the cuts that have been made to agencies over the past years. So if we take the police between 2010 and 2018, an overall budget cut of 19%, police numbers reduced by 20,000. How on earth can you maintain social control with that amount of deficit and that amount, less, uh, that amount fewer police officers. The CPS in the same eight year period has, has had its budget cut by 25%, staff reduced by a third. In prisons, same years, eight years, budgets falling by 60%, staff levels by 15%. We saw the worst prison riot in 25 years in HMP Birmingham. It was a privately owned prison, it's now back under public control. But think back to what I was talking about in terms of educating prisoners, dealing with their issues. How can you do that with these massive cuts, these reductions in staff, this reduction in funding? No wonder our recidivism rates are so high. And if we look at the probation service, we've got that 2019 report that highlighted problems of staff shortage, substandard performance of the CRCs, shortcomings in keeping victims safe. And as I put in my previous PowerPoint on the probation service, CRCs were due to be scrapped in 2020, but due to COVID, uh, that's been put on hold for a while. We then look at local and national policies, which um, are an issue, again, as a limitation in achieving social control because national and local policies limit the ability of agencies such as the police, uh, the police to achieve control. When a new law is made uh, or a new law becomes a pri or is turned into a priority by the government, well, that is likely to mean that other offences will be neglected to some extent as the police focus on the government's priority. Some people suggest that crime figures and government targets have meant that the police focus on trivial crime that's easier to solve and get your figures up instead of serious offences. But if you want an example, from 2010 to 2015, the government promoted a policy to tackle knife, gun and gang crimes. In 2017, the head of the CPS indicated that we were having a crackdown on social media hate crimes. So that would have moved the police's focus onto those sorts of crimes. I'm not saying that the police shouldn't have been focusing on those sorts of crimes, but of course, that attention is away from other crimes. Um, most priorities for police forces are set nationally by the Home Office, but others are set locally in response to local needs. So, and this is why I'm talking about local policy. For example, in areas, let's talk about knife crime again, where knife crime is particularly high, police may respond with extra measures such as increased stop and searches, and that then creates other issues within the community. You could use as an example of a local priority, weapon amnesties. So from time to time, local police forces hold amnesties where they won't arrest people who surrender illegal weapons. And you could use this example, a two week guns amnesty in London in 2017 led to 350 firearms and 40,000 rounds of ammunition being handed in. No bad thing. 
And then we finally move in this PowerPoint to crime committed by those with moral imperatives. Now, if you've got a moral imperative, which is a strongly felt principle, an overriding sense of what is right, maybe your views on assisted suicide could be used as an example here. But moral imperatives, if someone's got a strong belief that something is either wrong or right, that imperative may compel a person to act to uphold those beliefs, even if it means breaking the law. So here are some examples of some people that have upheld moral imperatives. And of course, the issue here is, it's very hard not to stop them because they believe that what they're doing is right. So this lady here, Kay Gilderdale, assisted in the suicide of her daughter who'd been seriously ill for 17 years. She was charged with murder and acquitted. This man here, Alan Blythe, was charged with cultivating cannabis with the intent to supply. He was cultivating 10 cannabis plants in order to provide for his terminally ill wife. She had multiple sclerosis to relieve her pain. He was found not guilty of supply, but guilty of possession. And what these above cases show is that it can be difficult to persuade juries to control the actions of those who they see as acting morally. So there's a limitation for you. And we can link this to theory. So functionalism might suggest that some crimes may be positive and serve a function in society. So cases such as Kay Gilderdale's may produce boundary maintenance by showing what's acceptable within society. So that's where the majority of right-minded, law-abiding members of society would reaffirm their values and produce social solidarity. So I suspect that what the jury was saying there is even though technically Kay Gilderdale had broken the law, what the jury was saying, do you know what? We don't think what she's done is wrong. We think it is acceptable. Just as in the case of Alan Blythe, they were doing the same. It serves a function. And I'll get onto this in my final slide. But of course, without these sort of things, laws don't change and society doesn't change. So sometimes you need these test cases in order for things to change, for judicial precedent to be set. But I think a good example of moral imperatives would be the case of the suffragettes. This is my final slide. So they campaigned for women's right to vote in the early 20th century, and they did that through direct action and civil disobedience. They deliberately broke the law. They set fire to post boxes, smashed windows in public buildings, cut telegraph wires, and then when they were convicted, they refused to pay the fines. So as a result, they ended up being imprisoned. Those crimes were motivated by a moral imperative to force Parliament to change the law, end the injustice that women were denied the right to vote. About 1,000 women were imprisoned and went on hunger strike. In 1913, the government responded to this by passing the Prisons Act. It was actually commonly known as the Cat and Mouse Act, like a cat playing with a mouse. Because what they did is they allowed the hunger strikers to be temporarily released but then re-imprisoned once they'd recovered their health. And this didn't work. And as more and more suffragettes refused food in prison, the authorities began force feeding them through a nostril or stomach tube. And in many cases, that actually caused permanent health problems. But, you know, they had a partial victory in 1918 when the vote was given to women over 30. And finally, in 1928, the voting age was equalized at 21 for both sexes. So the last thing in this PowerPoint, link it to theory again, back to what I said about functionalism and functionalists, they'd argue without deviant, I should say deviant, or not deviance, deviant acts such as the above, social change wouldn't occur, and injustices such as the inequality between sexes would remain. So there you've got some examples of the limitations, some of the barriers, the different things that might contribute to those high recidivism rates within this country, make sure you've got those to hand. Make sure you know your stats. Make sure you've got your case studies, because if you do that, your evaluation questions, which are worth the most marks, and it's those ones that get you to the A grades, the B grades, the A stars. N know that stuff, guys, okay?
hope you found it useful.